This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome you today on this first Sunday of the Advent season. The Advent season is that period of preparation for the celebration of the Incarnation, the coming of the Son of God into our world. The Bible describes it as light coming into the dark world. And for sure, we need the light of Jesus in our time. It's good to be together, sort of together, as together as we can be during this time of COVID. And we are asking everybody to do your best to uh, follow the sanitation guidelines that have been laid out. We want this to be a safe space for all who uh, come to worship with us. And so I say welcome. I want you to relax, enjoy the service. I hope that you will sense the presence of Jesus with us. Our Advent reading comes from the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to read a few verses from Isaiah chapter 9. And it goes like this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This time we're going to light the first Advent candle. Jacob is our candle lighter today. We light the candle of hope. Thank you, Jacob. We pray. Father God, we want to thank you today that Many years, in fact, many centuries before Jesus was born, you revealed to the prophet Isaiah that a Messiah would come, one who would bring light into the darkness of this world. And today we affirm that our Messiah is our wonderful counselor, that you are mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Be with us today as we worship together. Help us to connect with you at a very deep level. May not only our minds, but our hearts be impacted by your love so that our hope will be inspired to face the days ahead through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time we'll call on our worship team to come and lead us. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awake your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine upon us that we might be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smolder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You've made them drink tears by the bullfill. You've made us an object of derision to our neighbors 
and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us, that we may be saved.
Horsemen bring their treasures Shepherds bow down Angel voices sing a peace song What have I to offer Shift cry. 
Usually at this point in the service, we would dismiss the children to go to junior church, but we're going to keep you with us a little longer today, kids, because this morning we are going to share together and celebrate together one of the most special and sacred things that ever happens when the church comes together. We're going to have a baptism. And that is oh so significant. From the very beginning of the Christian church, baptism has been an outward visible sign of an inward spiritual change. And that is such a wonderful and, and remarkable thing. When God does a work in a human heart and changes us from the inside out. Now normally, at this church and in the group of churches of which we are a part, we have baptized people by immersion. In other words, we have normally had a tank brought in and we filled it with water and we have actually had people go completely under the water. Now, the Bible talks about the importance of baptism but it never says how exactly it has to be done. And many churches do baptize by pouring water over the individual who's being baptized rather than putting them completely under the water. In view of the current situation, we are going to be baptizing today by pouring water over Randy. Now, she'll be just as baptized as anyone who went under the water, okay? When we were living in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, we attended a Lutheran church. And uh, the Lutheran church would always put water on the head of the one being baptized. And uh, Mark Martin, who was the associate pastor there and a very good friend of mine, used to say, is your head wet? <laughs> that was his, his uh, expression for in telling people about the importance of, of baptism. So at this time, Randy, would you come and join me here? Randy, we rejoice that by God's grace, you have uh, come to a point where you have recognized Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior, that you have committed your life to him. And today, this group of people is here to celebrate with you and to affirm you, and others who are watching online are doing the same, and, uh, and we are just so, so glad that you have got to this day and that God has done this work in your heart. So I'm going to ask you one question, and it is this. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that he has forgiven your sins and made you God's child? Yes, I do. Because you have affirmed your belief in obedience to the command of Jesus Christ, we are going to baptize you. I will ask you to kneel, if you will. And I baptize you today into the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may rise. Let's affirm, Randy. I, I must say, one of the greatest privileges of a pastor, of this pastor, to baptize a baby believer. <laughs> May God bless you. All right. I know that normally we would want to surround her with uh, hugs and all kinds of things. Um, do take whatever opportunity you can to affirm Randy 
in this incredible, important step that she's taken today. At this time, uh, children, we're going to dismiss you for junior church, and uh, your leader today is Valerie. Wow, look at all those beautiful children. God bless you, kids. Wow. It is my privilege today to share with you a message of hope. I've made an acrostic out of the word hope. H-O-P-E. Today we're going to say that H-O-P-E spells hope and stands for hold on, persevering expectantly. I want to read with you another scripture. This one from Romans chapter 5, and we will read the first five verses. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. A traveler by the name of Rosita Forbes was in India one day many years ago and was unable to find shelter for the night. Finally, she took shelter in a Chinese temple where she slept on the floor. During the night, she awakened, and when she woke up, she saw that the moonlight was coming in through the window and shining on the faces of the gods that were set there on the shelf. And it struck her that on every face there was a snarl or a sneer, as though they hated people. You know, there are many people in our world who live with the mistaken idea that God hates them, or at least that he's so very angry with them that he could never, ever love them. But nothing could be further from the truth. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. To know what God is like, you must look at Jesus. Jesus was the most loving person who ever lived more loving than any other person has ever been or could ever be. Not only does Jesus show us exactly what God is like, it is through him that we enter into an intimate, personal relationship with the God who loves us. A God who loves us so much. More than we can ever possibly understand. More than you can even imagine. The world hopes for the best, but Jesus Christ is the world's best hope. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah delivered a message of hope. And this is what he said. He said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now that's a prophecy of the Messiah who was going to be born. Have you ever gone for a walk in the dark? I mean when it's really, really, 
really dark? In the part of the world where we live, it seldom gets completely dark at night. During the summer, we have long days and the twilight lingers into the evening and the sunrise comes early. During the winter, we have much shorter days and longer nights, but because we have a snow cover, it reflects the light of the moon and the stars. I got up during the night last night and looked out of the window and with the moon so large and the snow down there, I could see things pretty clearly. It wasn't as dark as you might expect at night. We spent some time living in Africa, and for some reason, nights in Africa were so much darker. I mean, it was really, really hard to see. I guess that's why they call Africa the dark continent. <laughs> but the only place that I have really experienced complete darkness was at the bottom of the mine when I worked there many years ago. When you're three quarters of a mile underground, everything is dark. And unless you have artificial light, or light from a human-generated source, there's absolutely nothing to be seen. No light. And when there is no light, there's no movement. If you're working alone in a drift and your light goes out, you don't walk because you would walk immediately into danger. The only thing you can do is to stay where you are and wait until somebody with a light comes to find you. Then you follow the light to safety. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You have heard the adage, where there's life, there's hope. Well, I would suggest that we might also say, where there's light, there's hope. We are walking in darkness as long as we are living in a sinful condition. Because God is holy, sin cannot go unpunished. That's the bad news. The good news is that the punishment for our sin was laid on Jesus. He who never sinned took our place. He was punished for sins that he never committed, for sins that we committed. And I believe that if there was only one person, if you were the only person in the world that needed saving, Jesus would have died for you. You see, the debt that we owed has already been paid in full. We need to understand that we are not forgiven because of good things that we do but because of what Jesus has already done. The Bible says that our own righteous acts are like filthy rags, permanently stained clothing, if you will, that is good for nothing. What a gift God gives us. His gifts are good gifts. I can still remember, although it's getting to be a long time ago, our wedding day. And uh, the reception that followed the ceremony. At that time, at least in the uh, family circles where we grew up, it was uh, expected that you would open your wedding gifts in public at the reception. And that is what we did. We, uh, we took the gifts and, uh, you know, we read the cards and we opened them up and, and we came to one gift. It was, it was, a, like it was a big, big box, a, a good size box, but it was beautifully wrapped. I mean, it was, it was professionally wrapped. It was from my grandparents. My grandma, Anderson, wanted to be so sure that this package was done upright that she had actually taken it 
to somebody who wrapped gifts professionally to have them make it look real, real pretty. After all, I was the first of her grandchildren to get married, and, and boy, she was doing it upright. My dear wife, my bride, opened the box, and it was completely filled with rags. We <laughs> didn't quite know what to make of it. Um, thank you, Grandma. <laughs> I guess she wants my wife to maybe make a quilt or something. Um, you know, we were a little distracted and didn't think too much more of it. We had planned a honeymoon at a cabin up north on a lake. We headed up there after the ceremony. Well, after our wedding night at the Besborough Hotel, but I won't go into details about that. Um, we went up to the cabin up north, and, uh, and it rained. And it rained for four days solid. And we said, we're not, we don't want this. So we, we left the cabin that we had booked for two weeks, and we started driving south. We went down through the Cypress Hills Park and then on down into Montana. And eventually we worked our way around and, and came up through Shonovan, Saskatchewan, where I had uh, an aunt and an uncle living who uh, operated the uh, Case Implement dealership at the time. My grandpa and grandma were actually living in an uh, in-law suite in their home. So we came and, and thought we'd stop by and, and just say hello on our, on our way back home. So we went to the house and we knocked on the door and, and my grandma answered. And when she saw us, she said, I'm so embarrassed. I'm mortified. I'm humiliated. And she went through, I can't remember, several long words that she must have worked on for some time. And uh, we didn't know what she was talking about. But what had happened was this. She had taken the wrong box to be wrapped. <laughs> Grandpa and Grandma had, had purchased a beautiful barbecue for us as a wedding gift. But uh, she took the wrong box to have it wrapped, and we got rags instead. <laughs> we got the barbecue. <laughs> um, it, was, it was kind of a lesson, though. It reminded me of the fact that our own righteous acts are like so many rags in God's sight. The great gift, the gift of salvation, is one that is given to us freely. And it came wrapped in the person of God's Son. We are saved not by what we do, but because of Christ's sacrifice, which we appropriate by faith. Today we have witnessed a young woman being baptized as a follower of Jesus. I think it is very appropriate that we have a baptism on the first Sunday of Advent when our theme is hope. I want to take you to another scripture, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, which says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It concerns me that many evangelical churches seem to treat baptism as an option for believers. But that is not scriptural. The Word of God links repentance and the baptism of believers to the gift of the Holy Spirit, also known in Scripture as the Spirit of Jesus. This is a divine mystery, and I don't claim to understand how it works. But God says it, and I believe it, and for me, at least, and I hope for you, that settles it. We say that baptism is an outward, visible sign of an inward spiritual change, and that is true. But baptism is more 
than just a symbol. In baptism, we are joined to Jesus forever. No turning back. The scripture says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. This is the blessed hope of all God's people. Because of Jesus, we have peace with God and become a part of God's forever family. The Apostle Paul wrote, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. I mean, that is one awesome passage. Because of Jesus, we can have this intimate, personal relationship with the God who loves us. It gives us hope. It's glory all the way. It is glorious. And everything that Paul says here about hope and glory is true. But in this world, followers of Jesus can expect trouble. In fact, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, or take comfort. I have overcome the world. It was tough to be a Christian in Rome in Paul's day. It was dangerous. It was risky. You know, sometimes it can be tough to be a Christian in Delisle, too. Sometimes it gets real bad. Sometimes troubles seem to pile up and sorrows come to the point that you feel you're going to be overwhelmed. Paul writes that trouble, suffering, produces perseverance. You know, a tree that is grown in a greenhouse never has to put down a strong root system. It's never exposed to the winter storms or the droughts that may come. But a tree that is on the side of a mountain, exposed to the weather, that tree has to put down strong roots that are going to keep it securely in place. Paul says that trouble produces perseverance. Perseverance endures. Perseverance is the quality that keeps us keeping on. You have no doubt heard of the patience of Job, right? People talk about the patience of Job. Actually, a better translation of that word would be the perseverance. Of Job. Actually, when I read the book of Job in the Bible, Job doesn't seem all that patient to me. But he, in fact, does persevere through the most terrible troubles that you could ever possibly imagine. He had been a wealthy man, and all of his wealth is wiped out in a single day. He had a large family, and all of his children were killed in what appeared to him to be a natural disaster. His health was taken from him. He was covered with boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. If you've ever suffered from a boil, you know one boil can be painful. I can't imagine 
having them all over my body. Even his wife gave up on him. Curse God and die, she said. But he persevered. Although Job didn't understand what was going on and why he was suffering, he persevered in trusting God and he trusted regardless of the circumstance. When you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character. Character is inner strength and purity. Like metal, which has been passed through the fire, so that everything impure has been purged out of it. When suffering is met with perseverance, you emerge from the battle stronger, purer, better, and closer to God. Two people can go through the same experience. One says, I could never believe in God after what he let happen to me. The other person says, wow. I could never have gone through this thing if God had not been with me and his spirit within me to make it possible. Suffering produces character. Character produces hope. The character which has endured the test always emerges in hope. And hope now is totally different than a wish. People wish for all kinds of things, right? I wish I'd win the lottery, people say. I wish I was better looking. You know, can, there can be all kinds of things that people wish for, and, and very often wishes end in disappointment. But the kind of hope that comes from God's Spirit does not disappoint us. We never end up embarrassed because we hoped in God. Our hope is rooted in the love of God. I love Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, or hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. No matter what troubles life may bring your way, hold on, persevering expectantly. The hope that we have in God is bigger than the universe, stronger than evil, and longer than time.
God incarnate here to dwell, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. Praise His name, Emmanuel. Praise Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you as your children, boldly but humbly. You are so great, and you are so loving, and you are so incredibly awesome. And yet, you care about each one of us. You created everything that exists. You run the whole universe. And yet, you are concerned about those things that concern each of us. As we begin this Advent season, we want to thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of salvation that he brought. Thank you that your Holy Spirit applies the work of Jesus to our individual lives as we respond to you in faith and repentance. Today we want to thank you for the Advent season. It's so good to take time to prepare for something important. And we do want to have this month ahead of us be a time of preparation when we realize more than ever before the incredible miracle of the Incarnation. God, the Son, becoming human like Christ. us, as Lord and as Savior. God, you know the unspoken requests in each of our hearts. Those things that we cannot bring ourselves to say. Maybe those things that we feel too deeply for words. Thank you that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance develops character. And character, people of character, have a hope that is rooted in the unchangeable love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction. Yahweh will bless you and watch over you. Yahweh will smile on you and be kind to you. Yahweh will look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Maybe we should stand for this one if we can.